because I know he holds the future and life is worth living just because he lives now I want to tell you tonight that um, I grew up in a church, and I had a good church, but it was one of those churches to where if anybody lifted their hands, you had questions. You know what I mean? <laughs> you might hold them open, but you weren't going too much higher than that. Now, I don't think that we necessarily get extra credit or bonus points, but I do think there's something about saying from all of me, my hands to my feet, I worship you, O Lord. So I'm going to ask us tonight if we could stand and maybe just open our hands, if you will. I've got a five-year-old, and she still says something, and I love it. She gets her words turned around when she gets to talking fast, and when she says, I want you to hold me, she'll get going too fast, and she'll go, hold you me, hold you me. And sometimes I think the Lord says, that sure does make a daddy feel good, don't it? And boy, it blesses me sometimes when my children just say, hold you me. For a moment. So can we just do that in our heart and our spirit here tonight? Hold us, Lord. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. All fear is gone, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future, oh Lord, and life is worth the living just because. Yes, we exalt thee, O King of kings. Yes, we exalt thee. Yeah. And oh, Lord, and we exalt thee. And we You 
I'm worthy of all praise And my heart will sing how great is our God Oh, how great is our God Yes, there is a name I love to hear and I love to sing its worth and it sounds like music in my ears the sweetest name on earth and let the whole church sing say oh how I love Jesus come on now and oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me, yeah, because he first loved me. the Lord a hand tonight. Amen. You can be seated. Hey, if you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 18. Matthew 18. And in a moment, I'm going to begin reading in verse 21. Hey, let me see if you've ever read this before. And then I'll tell you where it's found. If a brother sins against you and he repents, forgive him. And you think, wow, that's pretty bold. But then he clarified it greater. He goes to the next verse. And he said, for brother sins against you <laughs> seven times in the same day. That's big, right? And he repents. Forgive him. Jesus said that, Luke 17, 3 and 4. I'm going to see if I can draw you in. I'm going to speak tonight on a subject, the gospel of forgiveness. If you profess to be a Christian and there's someone you can't forgive, it's because you don't understand the gospel. That, that's quite a statement. It may have even rubbed some of you wrong. But I didn't say that. Jesus did. This is, I believe, the greatest clarity in the Bible on forgiving people. And everybody's had people they've had to forgive. Uh, there's not a person here that hasn't needed to be forgiven. We've, and it only stands to reason that if you've been forgiven, you know how to forgive. And you know why you ought to forgive. So Jesus tells a story. And he tries to get us to think the way they think in the kingdom of heaven. So look with me beginning in verse number 21. Uh, then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. And now that immediately calls my mind back to Luke 17 verses 3 and 4. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to Seventy times seven. Who under heaven would you ever need to forgive 490 times? Are you married? <laughs> Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who waited to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him that owed him 10,000 
talents. Now, to understand the story, if you miss this, you'll never understand the gospel as Jesus taught it and what forgiveness looks like. How long in the first century did you have to work to earn one talent? Because he owed 10,000. How long did you have to work to earn one talent? 20 years. So I just figured it up again, so I just want to make sure I was right. That means you'd have to work 200,000 years. Here, here's the bottom line. Ain't nobody can do that. See, that's the gospel. No, nobody can earn his forgiveness. It's unmerited, uh, unearned. And then it says, but as he was not able to pay, and none of us can, uh, his master commanded that he be sold, and his wife, and his children, and all that he had, and that payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. And then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him, and he forgave him the debt. That's the only way you can deal with with 10,000 talent. You, either it's forgiven or it's not. I mean, you no way you can pay it. Then the Bible says in verse 28, but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Uh, what's a hundred denarii? It's about a three-month salary. Here, here's a good way to say it. Uh, you could put it in your front pocket. That would be a translation from some of the greatest theologians I've ever studied. So I owed a debt that if I could work 2,000 years, I could repay it. And I've been forgiven that. But I found somebody that owes me about three months salary, uh, pocket money. And, and look what he did. The Bible says, and he laid hands on him. Took him by the throat. It's the Baptist thing to do. <laughs> Pay me what you owe me. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet. Begged him saying, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. He should have immediately thought, uh, I've, I've got to forgive him. That's, that's exactly what I, I've just been forgiven. Far more than this. But, uh, and then the Bible says, and he would not. He went and he threw him into prison. Until he would pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done. Oh and by the way. When we get saved and forgiven. Other people watch us to see how we treat people. Uh, I used to say this. Getting saved out of the pool room. And you know being in a project. And being a hoodlum. And being arrested so many times. And arrested for stealing. Arrested for fighting. Somebody says you're not that big. I'm wound tight. But the bottom line is. Uh, when that happened, I, 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 was, I, I was intrigued. I came up with this all on my own. I, I, was, I would say to somebody, I'd say, man, I, I got saved. And somebody would say, well, how did they respond? I said, they didn't say anything. And then it dawned on me. They did say something, but they kept it to themselves. When I said, I got saved, here's what they thought. We'll see. Because if you're a Christian, when somebody squeezes you, Jesus comes out. But if you don't get saved, he's not in there to come out. So they'll see. And after a while, if your life's really been changed, uh, they'll come. I'm, I've got some more rabbits. Just came to mind right then to chase. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them, let them rest for just a moment while you're standing. When you sit down, I'm going to chase a few. The Bible says when they saw the way acted, they were grieved and came and told their master all that he had done. That's what we ought to do. We ought to tell God the Father how, how somebody in the family has been acting. And then his master, after he called him, said to him, and by the way, even though this man had been forgiven, I really want you to listen to the words that Jesus used about this person in the story. You wicked servant. You wicked servant. Wow, I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should not you also have you had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And as 
Master was angry and delivered him to the tormentors. If you don't know what that is, read Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. It is God's sovereign discipline. If you claim to be a child of God and you misrepresent the heavenly father, he will bring correction. If you're old as I am, this is the best way to say it. He'll take you to the wood pile. Uh, He will discipline you, chase him. In fact, the Bible says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. But if you be without chastisement, then are you illegitimate children and not sons. If you can live any way you want to and get by with it, it's because he's not your father. So he delivered him to the tormentors. Until he would pay all that was due to him. And so the heavenly father also will do to you. If each of you from his heart. Does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses. Just as we forgive those who trespass against us. And if you'll read the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, you'll notice when he says, Amen, he's not through. The next verse says, And if you'll not forgive those who sinned against you, neither will I forgive you of your trespasses. Father, speak deeply into our hearts. For Jesus' sake, amen. You may be seated. You know, I... uh, I think this message is somewhat simple, but I believe that it's got some deeper truths that I wrote through research. And I was thinking a moment ago, the last thing I need to do is rush through this. So I pray that you will um, be attentive and allow me to explain this passage. Most people dealing with unforgiveness base their grudge or their offense on what somebody did or said to them or what you did. Uh, Forgiveness is actually the act of setting someone free from an obligation to you that's the result of a wrong done against you. All of us at one time or another have been forgiven or we've granted forgiveness. Here's a good way to say it. I've owed and I've been owed. However, there's a temptation To bear injury in your life and as a result, hold a grudge, allow bitterness to set in and become unforgiving. Did you know that unforgiveness can lead to a bitterness that poisons your whole system? Uh, I I do not um, claim to be a great counselor. I took some psychology just enough to be dangerous. I'm basically a theologian. I studied theology for years and have studied it for the last 50 years. But God gives us wisdom. Uh, James 3.17 is the greatest commentary in the Bible on wisdom. And so I I pray for wisdom. A reason I read the Proverbs is because Uh, wisdom means to live life skillfully. I want to live it skillfully. So a lady came to see me one day, and I didn't do ongoing counseling. You could only really come and see me one time about an issue, and then I would give you my biblical explanation, and then if you wanted to continue counseling, I put you into a counseling ministry, somebody that was geared for that, gifted in that. So this lady came to see me one day, And I knew her husband well, so we're meeting for our one time, and she just says, "Um, I think this may shock you, but my husband's going to leave. And I'll just be honest, took me back. I said, you got to be kidding. She said, no, he is. They were extremely active at our church. And I said, "Uh, what seems to be the problem? She says, he's convinced that I don't love him. And don't ask me under God why I did this. But I really do believe the Spirit of God led me. I said, can I ask you a question? She said, of course. I said, uh, do you hate anybody? <laughs> and she, she looked at me and said, what kind of question is that? Now, let me tell you what, I humor myself. I really do. You don't have good sense. But I, I, I actually 
humor myself. I've often said that if a pastor is going to go the distance, uh, they need to have a sense of humor. And so, uh, <laughs> I thought to myself when she said, what kind of question is that? In the back of my mind, I was just thinking, just answer the question. But I mean, I didn't say that. And after a moment, she thought for a moment, and then her face began to turn red. She said, I hope he goes to hell. He deserves to be in hell. And if you know what he did, you would agree. He ought to be in hell. And I think, good night. Her daddy had abused her, and um, she was extremely bitter. The Bible teaches, you ought to write it down, Hebrews 12, verse 15, uh, that bitterness, um, the Bible uses the word that translates die, D-Y-E. It, it can die your soul. Um, here's another way to say it. You can't manage sin. Um, you can't compartmentalize sin. You think you can. So what this lady did, she allowed that bitterness. It, it died her soul. And the people she wanted to love, she didn't have the capacity to love because she was so full of bitterness. So her husband really didn't sense her love, even though she thought she was showing it to him. You can't do it. You ever seen somebody at church say, hey, how are you? Love you. Kissy, kissy, kissy. And then walk down the hall and say, I hate her. <laughs> they, they, they're in the church. Not here because this is the friendly Baptist church. <laughs> and so I placed that lady in counseling. And she dealt with her bitterness, and she and her husband are getting along just great. I, I love to tell the story because you can't make it up, but I, I just, uh, I, I have a jeweler that got right with God under our ministry. He sells some of the most expensive watches in the world and huge diamonds, and he's just a great, great friend. I married him and his wife, and he, he used to give me some of the most expensive pins, and I don't know when I'd let somebody borrow one to sign a book. Maybe they forgot to give it back or maybe I forgot to get it back. Anyway, I just kept losing them. And I just refused to carry them. I've got some in a safe at home, but I just don't even carry them. It mean nothing to me. But I buy, you know, cheaper pens and pick up pens. You know, I was at a ministry recently and they were giving out pens. So probably a 99 cent pen. Let me tell you the problem with these. Sometimes when you're flying and I hardly have any shirts with pockets anymore, but that day I did. And I had that in there and I'd been writing and a lady came down to give me uh, something to drink and she said, oh my, look at there. And I looked down on a white shirt and there was just soaked right there. The, um, the cabin um, pressure evidently had caused it to burst in my pocket and so big black dot she said don't you worry about a thing seltzer water will take it right out I said awesome she went and got me a, a, a washcloth and some seltzer water and I started scrubbing sure enough it started coming out only problem was when I finished this whole side of my shirt was was gray it was a, a gray gray shirt and I was going to preach come back that night didn't have any other clothes with me and so just like a new style and, and really what it was, what the ink did, the ink died my shirt. That's exactly what unforgiveness does to your soul. Yeah. Yeah. It, it'll just, it just dies. Uh, and you look at it in, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. You see, li listen carefully to this. Unforgiveness is a bondage that stifles our ability to love and accept those who we know in our hearts most deserve our love. It's a bondage that, ch listen, it chokes out the abundant life promised by Christ to those who believe. So to understand what Jesus Christ did for us and then to refuse to forgive those who have wronged us is to be like the wicked, ungrateful slave. Uh, forgiveness involves three elements. Number one, there's an injury. So we're not denying that something hasn't happened. Uh, what was said or done. So let's acknowledge that. And as a result, a debt is incurred, resulting from the injury. And we have a tendency to say, he or she will pay. 
But then forgiveness is, the forgiveness is not whether they deserve it, but you know that it's going to do damage to you, and it's the cancellation of the debt. Uh, Matthew West, in his song, Forgiveness, makes a statement. And sometimes we give people credit for a statement. Corey Ten Boone is actually one who said it. And if you've never read Corey Ten Boone's book, book, if Corey Ten Boone can forgive, listen to me, anybody can forgive. Uh, she was in a Nazi camp where she was violated in every way possible. And men came in and raped her younger sister. Soldier after soldier, German soldier. And then she was there when the war ended and she was set free. And guess what she did? She stayed in that city and would preach the gospel on the corners. And in one of her writings, she said one day when she was preaching the gospel, she looked up and there was the soldier that had raped her sister. And she said, and you can do this. People say you can't have two thoughts. I can at the same time. Uh, I may be schizophrenic, but I can have two thoughts at one time. And so she said, as she was preaching, she was saying to herself, can't forgive him, Lord. And then he said that, uh, she said the Lord spoke to her and said, uh, I can. I can forgive him. And I, if you'll let me, I'll forgive him through you. And long story short is, she forgave him, and that day, that soldier came to faith in Jesus Christ. And listen what Corey Ten Boone said, and I quote, To forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner is you. So you say, well, I forgave them today, I set them free. No, you forgave them today, and you got set free. That's the difference that it makes when you forgive. So God desires for us to set them free. You know, um, let, me, let me say this quickly and just let your mind get around this. When I was writing this sermon, I began to um, think about the contrast of terms in this passage. So let me give you the contrast. In verses 21 through 35, we see the word anger, but then we see the word compassion. We see the word prison, but we see the word release. We see the word choking. And we see the word forgiveness. And it's all in the same story about forgiveness. You feel like choking them. But by the grace of God. In God's grace only. You forgive them. You wish they were in prison. But then you're willing to release them. You're angry. But then you begin to actually pity them. And show compassion. Here's a great way to say it. Forgiveness reflects the highest human virtue because it so clearly reflects the character of God. So a person who forgives is a person who emulates godly character. So I'm only going to talk about two things tonight. Uh, <laughs> there it is again, my mind. Um, my girls, when they were little, <clears throat> they used to always uh, wonder if I was going to keep them long or not since they're my girls and I'm the preacher. They probably had people ask them, so, uh, Daddy, how many verses are you going to preach tonight? And how many points are you going to talk about? And what they were trying to do is measure how long we were going to be there. And you women would get a kick out of this. One night, my wife and I walked into church, and she said, I just got to be honest with you. I just didn't feel like eating lunch today. I'm starving. I said, well, guess what? So am I. But don't worry about it. Janet, I'm going to preach about 30 minutes. We will be walking out of here one hour after the service starts. Well, you'd have to know my wife. My wife set her alarm on the front row. I mean, when they wow, wow. And so I'm, I'm preaching, and as always, I had stretched the truth a little. I weren't through, and her phone's going off. Well, everybody in the church is looking at her, and there's a lot of people there. She's getting her pocketbook and everything. And, and so we have a great relationship, and I just said, Woman, where, where are you going? She said, um, You said you were going to be through in an hour. And you were hungry. I'm hungry. I'm going to eat. And she started walking out. And then everybody began to applaud. And uh, I lost. And so I just said, uh, God bless you. Good night. I'm going to dinner. 
So I just want you to know I've been known to surrender. But I'm just going to talk about two things. Number one, I want to talk about the depth of forgiveness. So, so I want you to see this with me in verses 21 and 22. Let me tell you what Peter's doing. When, when you meet with Jesus, say, and think about this. Uh, somebody could ask a pastor this. Hey, uh, if you could help me with the Bible. Um, I've got somebody that um, they've wronged me more than one time. Pastor, you tell me, how, how many times do you think Jesus wants me to allow them to wrong me before I'm done with them? Uh, oh, and by the way, um, when somebody says, uh, they've wronged me one time, I'll never have anything else to do with them. I, I want to ask you something. Could you imagine Jesus saying that? Uh, well, and by the way, only God knows how many times. I don't know about you. But it seems like every morning when I study my Bible, there's something I have to have a, a, an adjustment in my life. And, and what if Jesus said, well, sorry, Pastor Johnny. I don't have any, if, if he decided he wouldn't have anything else to do with me, I'm doomed. I'm doomed. So I, I just know that I can't say what I know that he would never say. And that's just a good test in your heart. So, so Peter's trying to cal calculate, listen to this. Something that just doesn't seem to add up. How many times do I forgive somebody that sins against me? So how many times do I need to forgive somebody before I can make them pay me what they owe? And, and Jesus has a different idea of the value of forgiveness. And by the way, just in case this fits, many times there's unforgiveness because somebody borrowed something from us and have not repaid us. Now, I, I don't know that there are many adults that that hasn't happened to. But the Spirit of God taught me something. Listen to this. You should never loan anything you can't afford to give away. And so I've loaned stuff before. And I'm going to be honest. In hopes they would repay. But with the understanding, if they don't repay, I can afford to give away. I never loan more than I can afford to give away. Wow. I've got a lot of people coming to mind right now. I need to move on. <laughs> you know, even though Jesus taught that if they sin against you seven times, forgive them. Um, I want to put this in the context of the New Testament with Jewish tradition. Jewish, Jewish tradition taught that we forgive three times. So what is Peter doing? Peter's a Jew. Peter doubled the number and added one for good measure. Uh, I, I know the Jewish tradition is we forgive three times. I, I'm willing to give six. Make it seven. And then why would Jesus say 70 times seven? Because it speaks of the immeasurable and unlimited terms of grace. The immeasurable an unmeasurable term. No wonder when we sing, we call it amazing grace. That saved a worm like me. It's not wretch in the original terminology. We've just become dignified and don't like to consider ourselves a worm. Before too long, we'll say that saved um, a good person like me. If time keeps passing the way it's going. So by the time we've forgiven a brother or sister this many times, we're in the habit of forgiving. And so when you think of the depths of God's forgiveness, no one can touch the bottom. That's the depth of forgiveness. Number two, I want to talk about the description of forgiveness. When God wanted to describe what forgiveness looks like, he took us to heaven. He said, in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, life in the kingdom, uh, where we're going to live. Um, the bottom line is the reason we have to, to talk more about heaven is because really that's what eternal life is all about. Now, it gives abundant life here, but the fact that we're going to live forever, uh, we have an eternity mindset about the relationship. We, we really do believe that the Bible teaches we're pilgrims here. Uh, one of the books, when I got saved, this is just food for your thought. When I got saved 50 years ago, next to the Bible, what was the number one read book in the world 50 years ago? 
Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress. I've read it at least, I've read it at least five times. At least five times. The first time I had to read it in college, and it was in old English. Help me, Rhonda. I'm just telling you, good night. And, and so then I got an English translation and read it. And I know you're think I'm kidding. I got a children's version and read it. I wanted to understand the story that was written in a jail with metaphors of what the Christian life and journey is like from when you begin until you get into eternity. And so in the kingdom of God, he says, a person could owe 10,000 talents. In other words, 20 years to earn one. In terms of buying power, it was probably equivalent to $10 million. Uh, the talent was the highest known denomination of currency in the ancient Roman world. 10,000 was the highest number in the first century that the Greek language had a particular word for. So it really would take the largest word. Uh, like, I, I have no idea what a trillion is. I've used it, but I have no idea what a trillion is. I'm not sure how many billion. I'm sure you could tell me, or you'd Google it, and I could Google it. But it's there. But have you ever said this before? When somebody say, that person is so rich, and I'd say, they, listen to what I say. They got a gazillion dollars. That, that would be like a gazillion. Uh, what do you owe a gazillion? Uh, in the NIV translation, margin, it said the amount, 10,000, was so enormous that it was on the borderline of what the ancient mind could even conceive. So what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to tell you a story, and I'm going to use a number to which the first century, it's almost inconceivable that somebody could owe this kind of debt and that somebody would forgive that. So what is Jesus' point? Now here it is. Here's the gospel. The number is so vast, an unaccountable amount, it's countless, it's incalculable, and it's an unpayable debt. And the unpayable debt represents the debt for sin that every person owes God. You know, uh, I have had people to say this. Pastor Johnny, I've never been saved, but uh, I, I feel like I'm a pretty good person. And I'll just be honest, I'm going to take my chances. I believe when I get before God... And, um, and I think I will have an opportunity to tell my story. I think God's going to be reasonable, and I think he's going to let me in. If he, if he does, the cruelest act God has ever performed is allowing his son to die if there was another way. Matter of fact, listen, this is a good way to say it. God did not even lower the standard for his son. The reason Jesus had to die is in order to make provision for us, he had to, to receive what we deserve and the wrath of God. If you were to take the word, and you, you ought to learn these words. When the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for my sins, John, 1 John 2, 2, and not for my sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. The word propitiation is the word from the Old Testament, atonement, a payment's been made. Translate propitiation, here it is, wrath absorber. Jesus Christ did not abort the wrath of God. Jesus Christ absorbed the wrath of God. So, and he took it upon himself. Uh, he, when the Bible says he became a curse for me, it means the wrath of God was going to fall on me. And Jesus Christ stood between the wrath of God and actually uh, absorbed it so I could go free. And so, so he's saying, Johnny, I want you to know... Get into this story. I'm telling a story, and this is a story from the kingdom of God, and this represents the debt that every person owes for sin. All right, so let's, let's, let's see if we can take it down a step lower. What does it mean? There's nobody will ever be able to pay the debt for their own sin. Nobody. Um, I've told you, and you, you just know me from being here this week, and I have no trouble with words or whatever, but I was extremely shy. I remember I quit school because I wouldn't give a public book report. 16th, 10th grade, I dropped out. Never went back. 
went to night school after I got saved. Then I went to college and seminary. God dealt with me one Sunday morning in church. God dealt with me. He took the gospel and dealt with me. And um, coming out of the pool hall, hanging out being a hoodlum, I thought I was a tough kid. Uh, I had learned not to cry. Maybe you don't understand this, but when my dad would whip us with a belt, here's what he'd say. If you don't stop that crying, boy, I'm going to give you something to cry about. I, think. I learned to take pain, no tears. I've actually thought back on it. Two of my best friends got killed in a car accident when we were all 16 years old. And I can remember being there. And as much as I hurt inside, I never shed one tear for Wayne Collins. Never one. Couldn't, just couldn't cry. But yet now I'm sitting in a Baptist church. People in the choir feel like they're looking at me. And, and, and it, nothing ever bothered me until they say, we're going to stand together and sing an invitation to him. And the minute they start singing, I would start crying. And so one day, the preacher evidently, you know, we could be sensitive enough to know that the Spirit of God's working in the service. Here's what he said. Hey, there's a young man here, and God's dealing with him tonight, uh, this morning. Let's pray that God bring him back tonight and save him. I lived in Wilmington, North Carolina. Oh, by the way, it never snows there, but it did that day, seven inches. <laughs> that night, I went to church. Here's what I wrote. The reason that you ought to be impressed with me going to church in the snow, it only takes 19 drops of rain to keep 20 Baptists home. And yet, here I, I'm, I'm out in the snow to hear the gospel. And so I went to church. And I, and I love to tell because people have picked at me. And so I've come up with statements. Like I said, I, I went to church to get saved. One man pulled me aside and said, son, you didn't have to go to church to get saved. I said, no, sir, you don't have to go to the funeral home to die. But, you know, it's, that's where you do go. And by the way, can I say this? The church ought to be the place you think of that you can go to get saved. But in most of our churches, you can't get saved in the average service. They quit giving invitations. They don't invite you to come to Jesus Christ. They, they want you to figure it out on your own. Come and see us. All right, I'm shy. Come and catch one of us after the service. We'll tell you how to get saved. I'm not going looking for anybody. It was hard. And so, so that night I went back to get saved. And what I did, young man, I sat where you sat. I got on the second row, and I made sure I was on that side. I would have moved over because somebody skinny could sit beside you. I didn't want to crawl over anybody. So here's what I did. Roy Joyner, I've got the last voicemail he ever gave me in my phone. He was one of my friends, taught me how to win souls, him and his brother. And uh, Roy called me uh, the night before he died, and I've kept it for the last two years. He meant a lot to me. So Roy came in that night. I've never been to Sunday night church, never owned a Bible, never been to Bible study, never been to revival. And I'm sitting there on the end. He said, man, good to see you. Slide in. I thought, uh, I said, uh, I'd like to sit here. Come on in. I didn't want to crawl over anybody, sir. I wanted to get right out. I wanted to get right out. But, but the longer the service went, I got nervous. And I thought, I can't do this. So my wife Janet was with me, and I said, uh, Janet. When Mr. Gibson gives the invitation, go forward and tell him I want to get saved. <laughs> she responded, Johnny, I'll do anything for you I can, but I can't get saved for you. <laughs> You've got to come. I, 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 am, I, I have prayed. Every week, sometimes every day, but at least every week for a friend named Percy. I shared the gospel with him. He was a driver that picked me up when I flew into the airport in Springfield, Missouri to preach in Branson. And I mean, so we still communicate. He lives on the West Coast now. And I just believe. But I remember saying, um, hey, Percy, has there ever been a time in your life that you turned from your sins and placed your faith in Jesus? He said, my mother's one of the godliest women I've ever known. I never could get to him. He'd always tell me how godly she was. I'm grateful she's godly. She goes to heaven, you go to hell. You, you, got, you, you, you can't, you, there's no grandchildren in heaven. Uh, you, you come as a son or a daughter of God. So it's an unpayable debt that every person. So in order to teach that forgiveness, what it looks like in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus' story will contrast Forgiveness from the human standard of evaluation. So we can view our sin, listen to this, listen carefully. 
we can view our sin as a hundred denarii. This is what we did against them. We don't think what we did against others is a big deal. But if you sin against us, that's 10,000 talent. If you know what they did to me. No, no, hold on. That's the wrong question. If you knew what you did to him. That's how you, that's the gospel of forgiveness. It's not what you did to me. And see, normally when you preach about forgiveness, somebody's already sitting here now thinking, but he don't know if he knew what they did to me. And so it's always, they, they're the 10 talent, 1,000 talent. They did something that they, it can never be paid. Oh, but you've done wrong, but yours was always just pocket change. Whatever you kept in your front pocket. It's three months deal. Give me a break. So let my thoughts go there is to miss completely not only the lesson of Matthew 18 parable, but the heart of the gospel. So a hundred denarii, three months wages, nothing compared to what you've been forgiven. So to truly grasp the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will not happen until we see that our sin against the holy God is far greater in justice than anything that can be done to us. Lord, do you know what they did to me? If you'll listen, the Holy Ghost will say, do you know what you did to him? Matthew Henry put it this way. If that is the measure of the forgiveness the disciple has received... Any limitation on the forgiveness he shows to his brother is unthinkable. So I've got to see myself in the shoes of the 10,000 talent debt. And the appreciation of a massive debt forgiven, our sin against the holy God, forms the basis and the starting point for our forgiveness of another much smaller 100 denarii offense. So without understanding the depth of our sin against God and the riches of his forgiveness toward us, we'll never be able to forgive others. But when you do, others will observe you and they'll say, man, I know what they did to you. I don't know how you forgave them. And your answer will always be this, because you have no idea the massive debt God forgave me of. And that becomes the basis of it. God, I wrote so much more about that, but I'm going to get to the major part of it. Um, one, um, one scholar wanted to see if he could contrast and compare a hundred denarii with 10,000 talent. And so he used his mind as a mathematical genius. And here's what he said. When somebody sins against you, the Bible says it's equivalent to a three-month salary, a hundred denarii. But on the other hand, we... Sin against God is, is 10,000 talent. He said, in order to illustrate the difference, the 100 denarii, remember, keep this in mind. You can put it in your pocket. And if you're under 30, this is cash. You can go to the history station <laughs> and find out what it is. To carry 10,000 talent, it would take 8,600 soldiers. If we would place them three feet apart, they would stretch five miles. If you would give each of them a backpack and put 60 pounds in each backpack, 8,600 soldiers stretch further than the human eye can see on flat land. It would take that many to carry 10,000 talent. So it, you need to get that in your mind. 8,600 soldiers, 60 pounds in their backpack, 
three feet apart, five miles long, to carry the debt that you owe God. How about when somebody sinned against me? Pocket change. Put it in your front pocket. You say, wait a minute, you know what you're doing, Pastor Johnny? You're making light of what's been done to me. I'm not going to go into any depth, but let me just say this. If you knew, if you knew what's been done to me in the last 20 months through false allegation, if you had any idea, any idea, a story that literally, no exaggeration, wrapped around the world. David Murrell carried it on national television, CNN, all false allegation that soon will be acquitted. Soon. But until then, I carry it. And somebody said, man, how do you keep from being bitter? And let me just tell you, I want you, you men in the room, you adults here. I'm a father. I have two daughters, Deanna and Holly. Gorgeous kids. I'm a Native American. One's darker than I am. I'm half-breed. We were married Cherokees to Spaniards in the 1500s. One of my daughters got blonde hair and hazel eyes, but olive skin. Then I've got four grandchildren. Every single one of us are in full-time Christian service. And then i got a great-grandson that's 18 months old that carries my name. My middle name's Marshall, Hank Marshall. The reason I refuse to get bitter and to be unforgiven, are y'all listening? I'm shepherding my family. I, I don't want my daughter. When my daughter says, Dad, I saw so-and-so and fire was in my eyes. And I said, sweetheart, you know I love you and I want to give you time to work through that. But Jesus would not be pleased with that attitude. We've got to let Jesus use us. So, so don't, don't sit there. And I've not... This is 22 months. This is the first time I've said this from the pulpit. Because y'all are the friendly church. If anybody would understand, you would. And so I, I know what it's like to take pain, to take allegation. Somebody asked me today, and then I heard them repeat it. 90% of my friends, and I've preached all over the world, preached in every state in America. I've done every Bible conference. I've addressed the Southern Baptist Convention more than anyone that's lived in the last 50 years. 20 out of 25 years, I addressed the National Southern Baptist Convention. 20 out of 25 years. And now I'm not even in that family. I'm out. Until, and then when the false allegation comes and people are going to say, Oh, man, I'm sorry I hadn't called you in 22 months. Um. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. If trouble comes and you run, you are a hireling. You are not a friend. A shepherd stays there. I'm going to give this illustration, and I'm going to close. Some of the first mission work I did in my life was in Kenya. I will probably do most of the mission work the remainder of my life in Kenya. Now, I'm, I'm preaching all over the world. I'm getting ready to go to Portugal, Spain, Uganda. Just came back from Ethiopia. Been all over Asia, uh, all over Vietnam, Thailand. I mean, just, I've just preached all over the world. But I'll spend the rest of my life, massive parts of my time in Kenya. The government has invited me in to do something in training pastors and leaders. And I, I want to spend the rest of my life doing it and in preaching around America. But I work among a Maasai people. They're the most fierce warriors of the African continent. They live in bomas. Bomas are the thorns like they used to place on Jesus' brow. They take those, those, they grow wild there, and they use them as the boundary and parameter of their boma and their houses are cow dung houses. Everything over there for those people. There's not a doorway because the Bible influenced that crowd and Jesus says, I am the door. In order to go in and harm anyone inside the boma, 
when it's bedtime, the chief lays across the doorway. And the Bible says that uh, if you're a hireling, when the, when the wolves come for the sheep, you run. But a shepherd, wait a minute, lays down his life for his people. That's the shepherd that I want to follow. And that's the attitude I want to have. I want to lay down my life for my family. And say, so I want to be the one. Are y'all listening? I'm guarding the door into the Boma where the Hunt family lives. And by the way, I'm 71 years old. I'm the patriarch. There is no one alive in the Hunt family older than me. It's on me now. If I don't model it well, nobody will model it well to them. And if I allow unforgiveness to be that which causes bitterness in my soul. I'll not even be able to love the boy that carries my name. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you've got unforgiveness in your heart, I think I'd give it to Jesus tonight. He'll put it under the blood. He'll forgive you. And then when you see them, You'll be able to genuinely love them. And they'll know it because the dye will be removed. Uh, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they'll be like wool. And God will take that purity and that wool. And when you look at them and say, hey, sorry about, you know, the way I've been treating you. I've asked God to forgive me and want you to forgive me. And you're thinking, why are you asking them to forgive you? They need to be asking you. Because you're the, you're the man in the house. Uh, you, you're the woman in the house. You, you put on your big boy britches. You're acting like a Christian. You want to represent Jesus. You don't have to wait for them. Your attitude becomes, they come and ask me, I'll forgive them. You're as arrogant as the day is long. Not only do you need to get right in the air of unforgiveness, you need to give your pride to Almighty God. You humble yourself before Almighty God. And somebody said, Who would ever take the blame for somebody else's wrong? Oh, I can't believe you asked me that. The Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody says, wait a minute. Uh, They're the one that's guilty. That's the point I'm trying to make about the gospel. I'm the one that's guilty. Why did he pay the debt? Why did he make peace through the blood of the cross? Why did he make peace through my response? Peace came because of what he did and because of who he is. And that's what needs to happen in our lives as well. Father, in Jesus' name, have your will and way in our life. One thing we've found, when we come to the place that you're all we have, we find you're all we need. I thank you that you have proven that you're enough. You're enough. So work in our hearts. If there's any unforgiveness, may somebody leave tonight and realize they didn't set a prisoner free. They set themselves free. Draw us to yourself.